many thanks for everyone joining me um, this morning from wherever you are in the world. Um, obviously today the plan was to talk about three particular case studies that we've used over the last few years in small business acquisitions. Some of these you might have seen us talk about before, some of them are going to be brand new, um, all of them use different strategies. And actually yesterday, I got back from closing another deal down in the south of England, which used a completely wow. different strategy. So I'm going to throw in a bonus fourth case study here at the end. A couple of them we're going to whiz through quite quickly. Um, and then one of them we'll probably dive into in a little bit more detail. But hopefully what you're going to see is there are, are a plethora of different ways you can create a win-win scenario with other business owners. And ultimately, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to create a situation where both parties walk away happy. We get a cash flow in profitable company and the owner gets rewarded for all of the hard work they've put in over the years. So to start with then, uh, who am I um, and why am I here talking about this? Um, well, my name's Ross Tompkins, I'm a physio by background. And over the last three years, we've done 10 acquisitions, um, 11 including the one yesterday, although the uh, contract isn't signed yet, so I didn't update the slide. Um, we've also had four exits over the last few years as well. And during this whole period, there has been an any number of lessons. Um, I'm a firm believer that in every situation, you either win or you learn. Uh, and we have had a number of things happen that you probably would never come across in due diligence. Uh, and each of them have been a really good uh, learning uh, tool to make sure they don't happen again in the future. And some of those we'll, we'll talk about today. Um, so the first case study then. Therapy Direct was the first company that I started. I'm a physiotherapist, as you know, and Therapy Direct was an occupational physiotherapy company. So we provided doctors, nurses, physios. 95% of that was physios, and we provided them to large corporates throughout the UK. And we grew that business up to about 33 members of staff. Um, the world was good. And then we lost our biggest client. Our biggest client was Amazon. And Amazon said to us one day, we're paying you too much money. We're going to do it ourselves. Now, that created a big gap, a big gap in our profitability, a big gap in my time. And it turned out to be probably the most positive thing that's ever happened in my life. Remember, I believe everything happens for a reason and you either win or you learn. And I learned a very valuable lesson here that I didn't want to be over reliant on any one client ever again. And it's where I first came across the thought that we could grow an ecosystem of interdependent companies, a portfolio of companies, if you like, that would support one another through economic downturns, through anything that the universe could throw at us. Um, so that's what we set out to do over the next few years. And the very first acquisition we did was a bolt on to Therapy Direct. Remember, we'd been absolutely decimated by losing Amazon. We lost about 70% of our work. So we quickly acquired two other clinics in the northeast of England, which is where our head office was, that saw us double in size in a short space of time. They were small, a combined revenue of around £300,000. So this isn't, a, this isn't a big deal we're talking about, but it did teach me a really valuable lesson because I just started thinking about m and um, I didn't really have any mentors, advisors, or friends doing it at the time. I'd been, I'd been on the first, my first course to, to learn about it. Um, and a broker, a friend of mine said, I've got a physio practice around the corner from you. Are you interested? So we found this through a broker who I'm still friends with now. Uh, we went along and had a conversation and I'm a really big believer that no business has ever been sold unless there's rapport there. And I put a lot of emphasis on building trust, on building the relationship, on communication, because that was integral to how we funded this. 
because what happened i got on famously with the owner there were, there were two owners and they were in declining health when we met it was very very clear that we saw healthcare the same way we treated patients the same way we put them first so when it came to the us value in the company they said how much do you think it's worth i said i think it's worth this much and they said well it's a bit less than we thought but i explained why and they said well are you going to give us all the money on day one and i said no i actually haven't got any money i've never done this before uh, I was planning on giving you the money slowly over three years out of the profits of the company, which gives you stability. It gives you um, knowledge that you have money coming in over the next three years, guaranteed every month. Um, and for them, that was a win win. Um, and I stumbled across, I guess, this idea of 100 percent seller finance. We've never found another deal since then that, that worked in this way. But it demonstrated to me that there are all sorts of different ways to fund deals. Um, so we signed that um, on the day. The broker was there as well. Uh, the broker still jokes that, you know, that's that's how it went down. He wasn't expecting that. Um, but we did our first deal with no money, 100 percent seller finance. Um, as part of that, I guess, for for completeness, I also have to say we did acquire their property. <clears throat> so we, we did give them money for the property the property purchase, which I guess sweetened the deal somewhat. Um, so we found it through a broker. We funded it with 100% seller finance. And we grew that because we bolted it into our top co, Therapy Direct, closely followed by a second clinic. And then ultimately we sold that to a trade buyer. So it, we got to two years ago, we'd at the time we'd done about six acquisitions, I think. And what, what another lesson that we learn is it's far easier to acquire a company and um, put the right processes in place than it is to do that in a startup. Therapy Direct had been going since 2006. Everyone knew it was synonymous with me and my wife. So what would happen is if someone came to work and their computer didn't work, they would call me. Hey, Ross, my computer's not turned on this morning. And I would say, have you put a ticket in with IT? <clears throat> no, I called you. Well, have you spoke to your manager? No, I called you. I said, well, I'm rubbish at computers and I'm on the golf course, so I can't help. Um, so in the end, we decided that it was going to be easier to move this business on so somebody else could put the right structure in place and we could focus on our new acquisitions. So myself and my wife made a list of four companies that we saw as a good fit, four companies that we thought would um, add value to this company. And over the next few months, interestingly, without us reaching out, um, seven, uh, sorry, for all four of these companies reached out to us in independently. We narrowed it down to two, continued the process through negotiations and eventually sold it to one of our strategic partners, another physio company that we'd known for many, many years. So that took us right through from explosive growth in the occupational health world, then to losing our biggest client, stumbling across the fact that even small businesses can grow through acquisition. And then finally, we went through the exit process as well, which was a fantastic um, full circle. So we've seen both sides of it there. So that's the first case study. Okay, so case case study number two. So this is a really, um, really interesting one. So Normedica was a medical supplies company that we acquired back in 2019. Um, we acquired it about four months before a pandemic, which was incredibly fortuitous in many ways, because when our occupational health company was struggling because of all of the closures in the UK, our medical supplies business had an opportunity to help people all over the world. One of the key lessons here was not to take things for granted and, and mindset is absolutely key for success because the previous owner, there was three of them, one of them stayed on for 18 months and worked two days a week for us. And when the pandemic happened, um, he kind of crumbled and he was like, I'm so glad we sold the business to you. Um, it's absolutely a nightmare. 
Uh, I can't believe this has happened. Uh, let's just close the doors, send everybody home. It's a disaster. And I was like, are you kidding? This is a great opportunity for us to help people. We're a medical supplies company in the middle of a pandemic. Um, I literally jumped on a plane, flew to India. I was on, I was on the, the Wi-Fi on, uh, as I was flying, making appointments with people as I went. So I met loads of suppliers in India. Uh, I completely misjudged how big India was. <laughs> and I, I set up meetings in, in Delhi, Mumbai and Chennai. Um, with two days in each location uh, I got to got to Delhi it took me about four hours to go two miles and, and I realized I'd, uh, I'd bitten off more than I could chew um, we, we did a, a deal in Delhi uh, the next day India locked down and, and banned all exports and we still have money stuck in India uh, which is a bit of a sore subject um, but what happened is during COVID, we started to notice that the NHS were buying up a lot of medical supplies. And we foresaw a, a, a time in the future where that was going to cause a problem. So we started to look at what other industries we supplied to and where we could gain growth. And the industry that we came across was the scientific and laboratory side of things. Now, we uh, then discovered... This company, GT Vision, um, were a leader in their field of, of medical optics, um, and we approached them for an exit. Uh, again, they were up for sale with a broker. Um, so we don't mind talking to brokers. Uh, we've got our own uh, method of doing that, if you like, which we can talk a little bit more about later. So how did we find how did we find it? We we found this through a broker. How did we fund it? This was a really different one. Um, during the last few years, obviously we've seen all sorts of changes from the the, the macroeconomic um, things going on in the world. We had Brexit, we had COVID, we had inflation, we've got wars, um, and what that what that's done to the funding market is it's changed what funding is available. There used to be a lot of financial instruments available to do deals, often called acquisition finance from the more creative tier three lenders out there. And that's typically how we used or how we financed things in the past. Over the last year, they started to dry up. Um, so what happened with GT Vision is we reached a point where our funding had disappeared. And we had a very short space of time to close the deal. So we were buying this business for 1.2 million. We needed circa 600,000 for the day one payment. And the rest of it was deferred over four years. Um, small amounts for three years and then a balloon payment at the end of the four year, for fourth year. So a little bit like buying a car where you have this balloon payment at the end, which obviously improves cash flow quite dramatically. Um, now, how we did this is we reached out to our net network and we brought in nine external investors who all put in different amounts of money for equity within the company. Um, that created our day one payment without debt. So everyone put money in based on an equity stake rather than venture debt where that has to be paid back. So we've now taken control of the company without any expensive debt instrument, debt instruments. And we're now in a position where we're gonna grow this. Um, we're growing it through both organic growth and we're growing it through acquisition, unsurprisingly. And actually I've got a call later today with an absolutely perfect company, um, same industry, actually based just around the corner from me. So I'm super excited uh, to go and have that meeting later. With this one, what we're also uh, considering doing is bringing in um, external funding. So we're bringing in um, private equity money into this one so we can go faster. Now, we'll lose some equity, of course, but the trade off for that is we're going to have uh, more liquid capital available uh, in order to do more acquisitions in a shorter space of time. So that I think is going to be the method we use for growth with this particular business. 
and we haven't exited yet. However, less than two weeks after acquiring this company, um, I was already having conversations with a private equity company in LA who acquire companies of this nature. So I had a fantastic conversation with them um, and they were like, wow, this doesn't normally happen. We normally have to find companies to buy. And you're coming to us and saying, what do you need to see for us to become attractive? And they typically buy businesses that are doing around about eight or nine million in revenue. So we need to grow this by a factor of four to get to that size. Uh, they've given me the instructions to just check in every six months, every time I'm in London, pop along, have coffee with them. Their UK office is in London. Uh, and when the time is right, um, we're going to move this on to the company over in L.A. And the UK based private equity company that we're speaking to love the fact that we've got this end to end idea and we've got this clear exit vision. Indeed, we know exactly what size we need to grow to in order to exit. Case study number three, and this one we're going to go into a little bit more detail. So this one in particular is a domiciliary care company. We found it again through a broker. We funded it through um, predominantly acquisition finance. So that's one of those pots of finance that I mentioned um, a moment ago. We've grown it through acquisition. So we've done three acquisitions in behind this first one with a fourth one due to go in next week uh, and another three in ongoing communication with both for mergers and for a full acquisition. And we're already talking to um, two people about the exit. So we're negotiating what the multiple will look like at exit. And so a little bit more detail here. So we acquired this back in 2020. The initial business beacon was doing around 600,000 in revenue. And we valued the business at 200,000. And initially there was a mother and a daughter running this. And we, and we initially went to speak to them about a full acquisition. And as we started talking, it became very, very obvious that the mother wanted to retire, but the daughter wanted to grow this company. So we pivoted our, our offer on the spot and said, let's buy 50% of this company. We'll bring the knowledge for the growth and you have the operational knowledge to continue growing this company. So I became a partner in that company, a 50% owner. Six months later, we acquired 100% of a domiciliary care company in the town next door. It was a little bit larger, doing 750,000 in revenue with 120 net profit, and we purchased it for 350,000. We gave them 50% of that on day one, with the rest deferred over three years. And we've got a few more payments to make. We try and escalate it and pay off faster if we can. In July last year, so a year after that, we then bought 100% of our third care at domiciliary care company. Similar um, valuation, slightly bigger. Um, this one is down in the Midlands of the UK. And during this period, because we're working on the business, not in the business, we started to explore other ways that we can grow. And actually what we've did, what we've done is apply for our home office license so we can start employing people from overseas. And the first 12 people came over late last year, which then bolsters our ability to take on more packages and allows us to grow the business organically as well as through acquisition. From late last year through to Easter this year, there's been a lot of things going on behind the scenes. And, and eventually um, I came in as a 100 percent shareholder in this business after it was decided that was um, the best way to move this business forward. And um, that delayed things slightly with our acquisitions. But as I mentioned, uh, next week we should close on our fourth acquisition in this vertical. 
This one again is a little bit further down south, again, a little bit bigger. Um, it will give us a turnover, combined turnover of around 3 million at that point, which isn't bad from 600,000, only a couple of less than two years ago. And we, we're talking to, as I say, another um, three companies which should see us grow to a turnover of in excess of 8 million by the end of this year. Um, when an exit valuation far exceeding where we were at the very beginning back in 2020 when we took a 50% stake of a far smaller company. So you can see in a very short space of time, 2020 to 2023, we've grown this company um, up from 600,000 um, to 6 million. And then with the mergers up to an in excess of eight million closer to nine. And obviously what happens during this time is the multiple is going to significantly change. The larger the business, the safer the business, therefore the larger the multiple that some will exit for. So we like these small businesses. I know a lot of people in the world of M&A uh, only go over businesses doing 10 million, 20 million, 50 million. And the argument is they take the same amount of time to complete, which is true. But what I like about the businesses at this end of the scale is there's more of them. And also there's a very large arbitrage between the price you'll pay and the price you can exit for. So if you're scooping up businesses that are doing around three quarters of a million, one million, two million, three million, and the profit is less than a million, then you're likely to be picking these up for multiples of three or four. When you bolt all those together and you create a business doing eight, nine, 10, 15 million, whatever it might be, the multiple is going to go up well beyond to five, six, seven, eight, maybe even 10. So not only do you have the, the cash flow that this creates as a profitable cash flow and asset, but you then have the arbitrage between buying at three, selling at eight. And that middle bit, of course, then becomes all profit even if you're holding a little bit of debt in the middle. So, so far, we've seen the first case study, which was 100% seller finance. We've seen the second case study, which was uh, external investors, or almost like a search fund, although that wasn't how we set out to do the deal, it was more out of necessity. Um, the third deal here, we've used acquisition finance and, an, and a leveraged buyout strategy. Um, and the one, uh, the, the bonus one that we've just closed yesterday is in the recruitment sector. Um, and this is a work in strategy. So I started talking to these guys four years ago. A couple of months ago, they reached back out to say, um, I'm keen to explore an exit. But it, it became very obvious when we were talking that actually they didn't want to exit. They wanted to grow. So the deal we've struck with them yesterday is that we're going to come on board as their partners, as their advisors, and take a stake in the company. And we're going to, we're going to give the knowledge of the M&A space to allow them to grow um, from where they are now up to around 20 million in revenues, at which point then we'll exit together. And we have a four-year plan to do that. So very, very clear uh, path. And, a, and quite a nice little additional case study because, again, a very different approach to how you can come on board uh, to new companies, help them scale, and ultimately create capital events for everybody, everybody there, the business owners, and also us as the advisors that are coming in to help them grow. So the key lessons for me throughout this process have been the most important thing in any sort of business is rapport. It's the ability to communicate. It's the ability to create trust. It's the ability to ultimately create a win-win relationship. So never under underestimate the importance of going the extra mile, of going to see someone rather than just doing everything on Zoom, on talking about their family. What do their kids do? Where do they go on holiday? Um, yes, we want to know about the business, but ultimately you wanna know what makes them tick. So never underestimate the, the power of rapport. Mindset is crucial. 
it's a numbers game. Like any other type of business, you're going to get a lot of knockbacks. You're going to get a lot of no's. We've looked at thousands of deals, narrowed that down to hundreds and hundreds of conversations with prospective buyers, only offered on maybe less than 50 companies and done 10 deals, 11 now once this one signed. And, you know, since we started looking at this in 2017, it's a numbers game. You're going to get a lot of no's, which means you've got to really armor your mind. You've got to protect yourself against that there is a lot of negativity. There will be weeks and months when nothing happens and you'll feel like you're not making progress. Know, know that if this is something that you're keen on, it will take time. There is a lot of advantages in surrounding yourself with the right people, with the right knowledge. So it's great to get you all on this Zoom and hopefully today uh, help you all uh, in, in my own way. But mindset is, is key. There's a great little book called Go For No. If anyone, if anyone uh, wants to work on this, it's about 50 pages long. It takes half an hour to read and it gamifies the process where every day you have to get 10 no's in a row. If you get to nine and someone says, yeah, let's talk about it, you've got to start again. So it means you keep pushing day in, day out, and you've got to get 10 no's, 10 no's, 10 no's. So all of a sudden it switches your mindset from a no is, oh, I can't believe it, it's not working, never going to work, never going to get a deal done, to a no is good because now I've got to keep pushing. So go for no. Can't remember who, who wrote it, but it's a really great little book. Which leads us on nicely to persistence. You have to have the right mindset. You've got to protect yourself against those down days where you feel like you're not making progress. Keep pushing forward because as the saying goes, it takes a long time to become an overnight success. Um, we see people on stage, people who've done lots of deals over, over the time and we think it, it was, well, they'd make it look easy. A lot of the speakers we've got talking next week uh, make things look easy, but actually there's years and years and years in the making um Stephen Coon we've got on the call you know stands on stage talks about all of these deals but it's taken a long time and Stephen has lots and lots of conversations I'm sure you wouldn't mind joining at the end for perhaps part of the Q&A <coughs> sure. um so that is today's presentation we've got four brief case studies where we can see there are four completely different strategies to get into this world of, of business acquisition. If you haven't already joined, hopefully you will have next week, we have our three-day event, which is going to be amazing. We've got 24 speakers from all over the world, <clears throat> excuse me, including three of the biggest names in the world of m and um, And we do have an opportunity to upgrade to VIP. Now, VIP is going to be different from obviously the free one because you're going to get a chance to ask questions just like we're going to do shortly. Um, slightly different, it'll be all written into the chat, but you're going to be able to ask these speakers anything rather than just sit there and listen. So really big difference. And also the software system that we're using, um, there's going to be virtual networking. So there's going to be an opportunity to sit in small groups meet people around the world, ask questions, gain deal flow, gain really valuable knowledge of this sector and really valuable um, connections and, and with people around the world, brokers, financiers, funders, other potential partners. So if you, um, if you are looking to take it to the next level, I urge everyone to consider the possibility of a VIP upgrade next week. And that's it. Hopefully you guys have enjoyed that. Michael, I'll let you take over the controls now. Um, and let's get into some questions. Sounds great. Thanks, Ross. Um, yeah, so if you guys have any questions, um, go ahead and uh, put them in the chat. Um, the first one was from Eric. Um, he wanted to know about deal sourcing. Eric, did you want to come on and... and uh, now unmute yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Michael, no worries about that. Basically, Ross, the question was, what is the 
best way in, in your opinion and in your experience for sourcing the so we so we use a variety of methods so the majority of our deals up until now have come from brokers so we, we like talking to brokers actually although it's quite likely that um they'll often inflate the price so the, the the buyer that you're speaking to or the seller that you're speaking to has often unrealistic targets of what they think the business is worth our experience is after about a year the seller starts to realize that perhaps their valuation was wrong. Perhaps the valuation that they're getting from the buyers, us, was actually fair. And what they're going to do, they're going to think about all the people that have made offers over the last year or two, and they're going to go back to the one they liked the most. They're going to go back to the one who resonated with them the most. They're going to go back to the one who had the best rapport with them. So it comes back to this idea of rapport. So our, our strategy with brokers is it's a long-term play. Very unlikely we're going to talk to a broker and get a deal done in months, but a lot of our deals have come in years when they've eventually realised um, that actually we were a safe pair of hands. And the second thing which is working really well is LinkedIn Sales Navigator. Um, and that is an incredible tool. If anyone doesn't have Sales Navigator yet on their LinkedIn profile, um, it's, it's epic. You can really highly target any industry uh, and by being a little creative with your searches. So you can't search by revenue, but you can search by the number of employees they've got, or you can search by how long that person has experience in the industry. So if you look for a managing director, a founder or an owner with 10 to 50 members of staff who has more than 10 years experience, you're likely to find a business doing a few million in revenue at least that's been trading for a long time in a specific sector that you're looking for and in a particular geographic location. So I love Sales Navigator. And then how, how many leads per month approximately you get from the sales navigator? I normally turn it on for a week at a time um, because it is that good. Uh, and normally that week I get around 50 leads uh, and then I turn it back off again because otherwise we'd be too busy. Uh, Crazy. And, then, and then take the next six to eight weeks catching up with those people, refining it. Um, you, you'll meet a lot of people as well uh, who are in startup mode. So you, you get the opportunity to do some angel investing as well uh, and put in perhaps some seed money to help smaller businesses grow because some of them will slip through the net and you'll find smaller businesses. Um, so we turn it on yeah, literally for a week every couple of months. Uh, that generates the, the leads and then we work on that over a period of time. It's a great tool. It's about £80 a month, I think, but really worth it. Okay, thank you, Russ. All right, great. So um, next up, we have uh, Ting. Um, she she had a couple different questions, so I'll let her come on, unmute herself, and um, and choose which one she would like to uh, bring up first. I think you're Ting. I think you're still on. Uh, you're on unmute. Unmute there. Can you hear me now? There we go. Hi, okay. Hi, Ralph. How are you? <laughs> I'm very okay, well. so I, I raised two questions. Um, the first one is actually because, you know, I'm new to this game, right? And I do know a lot of people in my industry, which is property construction and finance. So obviously, I want to bring people, some people on this journey with me. <clears throat> but I am sort of trying to understand how would I bring them to the picture because you know, my my guess is most of the owners we they will exit over a period of time, and I do want to have a system in place where um, a particular person who knows this this type of business very well is overseeing everything periodically for me, so I can spend more time to acquire, expand consistently. So how do I remunerate this person um, fairly to reflect what they do to the business? And uh, also because I want to do both vertical expansion and uh, sorry, vertical expansion and horizontal expansion. So you, are you talking about having sort of a senior management team in to look after it? 
Uh, yes, but initially just like one person. Say if I want to build a, if I want to acquire a con construction company, then yep. I would like a builder to uh, sort of oversee the operations, uh, both the operational side, but also the performance, man uh, like performance improvement side for EBITDA mm -hmm. improvement. Yeah, so, so we we have um, our group managing director. Um, she started out just looking after one of our verticals. Um, and then she's that talented and amazing. She's taken over the other verticals over time as well. So she looks after the performance, the day-to-day -day management, looking after all of the teams and the staff. And it's funded evenly throughout the different verticals. So it makes, um, it, it reduces the, outgoings for each particular business so they don't have to all take on board a really senior uh, manager and that can be split between the different businesses so from a from a cash flow point of view it works really well but how would you remain remunerate them let's say you're starting this journey and you're acquiring company number one in the vertical of con construction let's use con construction as an example and if they're putting they're not putting any capital in I'm just assigning them to this particular vertical role to manage this vertical line of business. And because I don't know how many um, construction companies am I going to acquire in total in the future. So how would I remunerate them? Is that, a, for example, initially some sort of uh, monthly retainer plus profit percentage of the business profit? And then if they don't leave <laughs> after a period of time, then I give them some sort of shares. Is that how you do it? What's the percentage of shares that's fair? Um, it's entirely up to you. There's no, there's no right or wrong answer here. Um, it depends, I guess, on what motivates that person. We're all motivated by different things. Some people by recognition, some people by cold, hard cash. Some people would be happier with equity and a smaller amount. Um, so it depends on the person you find, I guess. Okay, so there's no has. I have to talk to this person, sit down and work out something that works for both of us. It's like more like a brainstorming slash negotiation kind of thing. Yeah, just ask them like what what okay what, what makes you tick? You know how how can we create a win win scenario for you here? Um, if you go if you go in with just I'm going to give you this it might be might mm. sound like an amazing offer to you, um, but that might be the last thing they want. You know, actually, they want the total mm -hmm. opposite. They want perhaps to be able to oversee it from a beach in Thailand on their computer, whereas you've just uh, and earn less, whereas you've just thrown a great big chunk of uh, money at them and equity. And they're like, well, that, may, that floats your boat, but that might be the opposite of what they really want. But I want to be on a beach. <laughs> <laughs> I want to be the person on the beach. Anyway, that's that. But I understand what you mean. Yeah, thank you. No problem. All right, any next questions. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Ross. Did you want to say that? I was just going to say any any other questions. Yeah. So next we have Tim Young. Um, Tim, if you'd like to unmute yourself, you can. If not, I can I can I can read out your your question. So he said, How often uh, would you see earnout agreements instead of seller financing to help fund or reduce the upfront capital needed? So if you want to add anything to that, Tim, you can. If so not, uh, yeah, yeah, just um, yeah, just wanting to understand that kind of structuring from a structuring point of view. Um, I know, yeah, I know you mentioned rapport before, and that's quite important. And I guess, yeah, showing your keenness for the, the role uh, for the business that you're looking at. Uh, but yeah, how often would you see, I guess, yeah, earn out agreements over a number of years? Even I guess, I think the owner's not staying on for a long period, mm -hmm. um, as opposed to seller finance. We we've never used an earn out. We've offered it on a number of occasions, but it's never been accepted. Um, no. I think it's got quite a negative. It's got a lot of neg negative connotations, I think, from the, from the world of urban A, particularly in larger deals. Often you'll see um, where all the profit is stripped out of a company, hived off to the new top co because the profit goes down. Therefore, uh, the earn out goes down. After maybe a year of the three-year earnout process, the previous owner that's been used to being their own boss gets disillusioned, hates having to report to a new owner every Friday, and they eventually leave um, without taking the further money off the table. So in essence, the larger company has bought it for 50, 60 percent, whatever the price was, and then got out of paying the rest. So that's a story or something along those lines that a lot of people have heard of. 
either a friend's been through the process with a larger corporate or they've perhaps read about it when they were thinking about selling. So we tend to get a lot of pushback when we offer an earn out. Although I have to say, from my point of view, I think they're incredibly fair. Um, you know, if, mm. if business kicks on, they should be rewarded. Um, you know, and yeah. if it doesn't do well, well, that protects us. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly my thinking. Um, yeah, if you're if the business is going as well as you say and it's as stable as you as you say, then why not? Yeah, you've got the right yeah. management team in place. But okay, yeah, understand. Okay, thanks. Thank you very much, Ross. No problem, Tim. Nice to meet you. Okay, next up we have Jasmine. Jasmine, are you are you still on the call? Do you want to unmute yourself? Yeah, I'm on the call. Sorry, I'm not going to turn on my video. I don't think my internet is strong enough. But um, my question was, what are the first things you do when you acquire a company or you merge with a company? Do you have like a kind of three months, six months um, things that you do each time? Um, we do. Yeah. So the first 30 days really is is really get into grips with their operational procedures, their how they manage the, the finances. Uh, and we see whether we need to tweak anything, if you like. But the first 30 days is, is just about learning. Um, we don't go in and change everything on day one. Um, the the hardest bit of an acquisition is not in the, is not the acquisition. It's the change piece. It's the, it's the transformation that occurs afterwards. It's bringing it into your group. Humans don't like change. Um, inherently, I think everyone is a little scared of it. So when you acquire a business, people are going to be thinking, are they going to sack me? Are they making everyone redundant? Are they going to asset strip the company? Are they going to move everything to the Philippines? Um, inherently, all these things kind of go through people's minds. So we learn as much as we can. And our senior management team go in and do that. So our uh, operations, our managing director, our marketing and our finance, we learn as much as we can. Uh, we take the bits that then are working really well and we implement them perhaps in our other businesses. And then we make suggestions and we'll slowly change things over a period of time. And how long of a period of time do you kind of envisage those changes to, to be realised? Um, it it really depends on on the business. I mean, it took two years for us to make the changes within uh, Normedica, um, and others we've done probably in six months. Thanks very much. No problem. Okay, next we have Blair. Um, wants to know your thoughts on professional advice slash services like legal and accountants. Blair, if you're still there, you can unmute yourself and add to that if you'd like. Um, yeah, thank you. Good morning, Ross. Um, yeah, so uh, the legal and, and accountancy side, are they part of your team? Do you outsource them? Um, how do you organise their fee structures? So it's outsourced and paid for by the target company. Um, I'm a really big believer in surrounding yourself with the right people. So surround yourself with the right mentors, the right advisors, the right legal team the right accounting team and at the right time in your portfolio growth it may be that that comes in house we have started tentatively looking at whether we can do a roll up in the legal field for instance and uh, so then that would be in house rather than outsourced but i think it's really important that you stick to what you're good at so i know that i am a terrible manager but a decent leader um you know, I get bored with the nitty gritty. I don't want to do someone's um, PDR, their professional development review. Um, I like the inspirational side, going in, connecting the dots, building through vision and growth, and then giving all the rest of it to somebody else. I'm not an accountant. I'm not a lawyer. I'm not going to try and do that myself. I'm probably going to come unstuck. So surround yourself with great people and, and you'll go uh, faster is my advice. And have you had any learnings? And inverted commons with the selection of accountants or lawyers and things? Uh, yes, uh, definitely find ones who resonate with you. And in particular, um, understand you from a personal point of view. So they understand your level of risk appetite, for instance. So it sounds like a little thing, but the first, the first uh, solicitors that we worked with, they didn't understand 
me, if you like. And I remember sitting there on as we were getting close to finalizing our first deal. In, in my head, when they were speaking, it sounded like they were saying, if in seven years all the planets align on a Thursday and, and it happens to be a day where you're wearing shorts, then the world could end and you're going to be on the hook for all of this, you know, all of this negativity and, and, and finance. Um, and I was like, I don't care. Like, have you not listened to anything that I've, uh, I've been talking about? You know, we're going to grow this. I'm confident we're going to do it. And it just wasted a load of my time while they were going through the minutiae of the detail. So since then, we've, um, we've got two other lawyers that we work with, one on smaller deals, one on larger deals. And they understand that there are certain things that they're going to skirt over and just make sure they've told me. And there are other things that go, no, Ross, you've really got to listen to this. This is a big one. Um, actually, this is what this might mean. So they get to know me. They get to know our strategy, our structure, and they'll only bring problems to me when they when they really think there is a real a real danger. Right. Thank you. All right. Next question is from Ali. Um, did any of the companies you acquire have debt? And if you'd like, you can unmute yourself, Ali. Yeah, I do. Can you can hear me, Ross? Hi there, Ali. Ali, yeah. Thanks for, thanks for the email, by the way, and thanks for your time for today. So I <laughs> appreciate organizing all the summit. No problem. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so actually really good, really good studies. So um, yeah, I want to get the understanding with the, any of the companies you or see you acquired had a bit of debt because if you had to find us just to, um, just so whether you factored in the debt ratio where you need to pay back compared to the cash flow. Um, so I just get a good understanding of that because I was looking at a company that had quite a lot, a lot of debt and uh, I'll find a few, um, if, you did, if you did have debt to see what kind of ratio with your cash flow amount. Yeah, so... Um, yeah. We haven't acquired any businesses with debt so far. Um, that doesn't mean that we wouldn't. You would just account for that in your valuation. So let's say the business was worth £5 million, um, but it had £3 million worth of debt. Um, our argument there would be, well, why would we pay you £5 million so you can pay off £3 million of debt? Yeah. Or two? Why don't we just take over the £3 million uh, and give you two, which means you've got less to finance. Um, what would be, of course, important there, as you've alluded to, is the DSR, the debt service ratio. Um, and ideally, the closer to two that number is, uh, of the safer. Uh, and we typically would try not to go below 1.5, which for anyone who doesn't quite uh, follow that at the moment, that means if you've got a million pounds worth of profit, um, you wouldn't want to spend more than 50% of it on servicing the debt. That means that you can... Um, weather uncertainty so if you have a couple of bad months um you've still got cash in the bank you can still cash flow the debt and you're not over leveraged to a position where the business could be put under financial strain yeah okay uh that sounds really good so i appreciate that i think yeah 1.5 sounds, sounds really good um the other one question was a little bit uh out there because the, the home care business you had um you end up owning 100 percent of it but the daughter was, uh, you said, uh, daughter, she became kind of the main operator. So yeah. um, so what happened? Did, did, did you buy her out or did she decide to go to do something else uh, with uh, that space? Yeah, a little, little bit of both. So so I bought her out. Um, so she's now gone off and now she's doing something similar, but without as much reach. So she's decided to stay a little bit more local where we've decided to go um, national. Uh, okay. That's great. Uh, my, my, my other last question was around um, your thoughts on going into different markets because uh, I'm into kind of area kind of, of fitness space, which obviously I run the physio, physio side, if you like. Um, but you obviously started with physio and I, now you're kind of looking at a recruitment side. Um, how you find your mindset going to kind of different sectors? Because um, sometimes I find that um, to increase my deal flow, I may need to look into different particular sectors. So... Have you had any challenge around your mindset around that, or, or you more or less think about you just can't you just kind of get experts in? Uh, so I'm thinking about in terms of um, giving value obviously to, to their business. So yeah, how do you find that? Yeah, it's a really great question. Uh, initially, so if I go back a few years, um, I, I, I'm 100% focused on healthcare, and the reason for that is because I understand it inside and out. I'm a physio. I've been doing it for 20 years. 
And actually, although you'd imagine physio is just physio, healthcare is so much more. So I could still build rapport and credibility with a surgeon uh, or with a, an aesthetic beauty clinic or any part of healthcare, you're going to share so much that you can still build trust and rapport. So initially I focused on what I knew and I found that was really advantageous. Um, over time, of course, we've also now picked up a lot of skills in the wider M&A field. So now we're able to talk more broadly to recruitment companies, manufacturing companies. I own a stake in, a, in an HVAC company um, as well. And that's because we're bringing value from mergers and acquisitions, financing, funding, accounting, legal perspective. You know, an HVAC company doesn't need a physio, but they do need access to funds. They do need access to the right advisors. They do need to know how to grow into other markets or to, um, to diversify. So that's what we've been able to do. I couldn't have done it straight away. Yeah. Okay, I appreciate that. And just one last question, sorry. Um, uh, within any of the businesses, have you thought about using kind of the employee ownership trust or to benefit, of course, maybe the owner of all for yourself for the later date in terms of changing that over for the um, one tax benefit and also for the employee ownership side? Have you, I don't know if you had that in mind with any of the uh, structures you had. Um, I haven't at, at the moment. It is something that's been on my mind to look into in more detail. I must admit, I don't understand it fully at the moment. Um, I understand there are a lot of positives from a from a tax point of view. Um, but yeah, it's a great question and one that I honestly don't know the answer to. Oh, great, appreciate it. That, that, that was all my questions. I uh, hope not to take up more time for everyone else to go to ask. But uh, <laughs> thank you very much, folks. Yeah, I'm definitely looking forward to obviously next week. So yeah, I'm ready to go. Appreciate it. Excellent. Awesome. Great, thanks, Ali. So we have uh, one another question here from... Looks like his name is Good Luck. Uh, is it okay to use your name at first without setting up an SPV before buying your first business or building up your dream team? Um, if you'd like to unmute yourself, you can. I don't know if you're still here. I'm going to say goodbye. See you later, Catherine. Catherine's got to go. Okay. Looks like he is still here, but not unmuting at the moment. So maybe Ross, you can go, go ahead and start answering and if you'd like you can um yeah so what's really important here is positioning i mean michael i've have, have actually talked a lot about this um positioning is absolutely key in all industries and if you put yourself in the seller's shoes let's say you've been working for 30 years you've built up an amazing business they're doing 1 million, 5 million, 10 million, whatever it might be. It could be in any industry, manufacturing, they might make shoelaces. It doesn't matter. And then all of a sudden, someone comes along with a Gmail or a Yahoo account, no website, no logo, no business, and offer to buy your business for 5 million pounds. Are you going to take them seriously? No, you're not. You will probably not even pick up the phone you probably won't even respond to the letter because when a letter drops through the through their letterbox or um, they get an email from you, they're going to do their research. And in this world we live in now, um, your history is only as far away as their hand. They can Google you straight away. Who is Ali? Who is Michael? Who is Ross? And they're going to get from that an idea of who you are and what you're capable of. So super important, I think, to, to build that image first. Make sure your LinkedIn reflects who you are saying you are when you're having these conversations. Uh, make sure your um, website, if you have one, tells people what they need to know, because that's the first that's their first um, insight into who you are and what you're capable of. And actually what this comes down to, and a few of you will have heard me talk about this before, it's um, the zero moment of truth. So the zero moment of truth is the moment that someone feels that they trust you enough to do business with you. And this is a piece of research that was done by Google around a decade ago. And uh, they, they now think because of technology, you need to have 11 touch points with someone across I think it's 4.8 or say let's say five different mediums 
So that's 11 times someone has to have had an interaction with you before they trust you over five mediums. So an, and a medium can be a letter, your LinkedIn profile, a WhatsApp, a phone call, a Zoom, a face-to-face -face coffee. It might be them seeing your, your social media Facebook program, your pr protocol, um, or your in Instagram. It could be commented on a thread of theirs, on threads. Um, so all of these different methods that you've got to contact someone subconsciously heads or move someone towards the zero moment of truth, where they've had lever interactions across five different mediums and they feel able to trust you. Those mediums have to support the story that you're telling. And the story that you're telling is, I'm a capable, safe pair of hands that can take your business from you, grow it, look after your staff, look after the legacy and give you the money that you fairly have worked for over these years. So if your LinkedIn profile says that you sell grapefruits on the beach somewhere, um, they're not going to tell you their shoelace business. Um, you know, if, if your um, Facebook has you just going out and getting pissed all the time and putting loads of pictures on with you being Larry, um, they're not going to sell you their 10 million pound um, recruitment business. Does that all make sense? That was a really long, long way of answering that question. But no, I wouldn't. I wouldn't go with you. I wouldn't go with just your name. Don't have a email. Don't just give them a, a mobile number. It makes you look small. Awesome. That's it for the questions. Now I know we've got actually got one of our expert speakers tuning in. He's got a bold, but Stephen just wanted to see if you want to come on and add anything. Um, Hey, thanks, Michael. Hey, thanks, Ross. Good to see you guys. Hey, everybody. I just I'm I'm joining. Looking forward to the um uh, to the summit next week. Um, I know Ross and Michael really worked hard to put this together. So we're excited to see the three top um, M and A specialists in the world on one episode. It's incredible. It's incredible to see all these people. And then, of course, all the um, em empresarios from the UK, like Nick and uh, Ross and um, John Ketley and things like that. So you you really want to tune in. Which, as far as this goes, Ross. Um, you know, if you don't know Ross, like I know Ross, we work together um, uh, and we travel together and we did plant medicine together. So, you know, we, we've really gotten to know each other. And that's a guy I highly, highly respect. Everything he says sits like a perfect, perfectly tuned clock. So, you know, just 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 keep following this space with uh, with Ross. Thanks, brother. Thanks, brother. Appreciate it. Awesome. Thanks. Well, yeah, that's that's it for the questions for now. So, um, yeah, uh, Ross, if you'd like to wrap up, I'm going to put uh, up on the screen the VIP information again. Yeah, we, we just, I just really, really appreciate everybody uh, tuning in today from all over the world. It's been an absolute pleasure to share some of my uh, experience with you um, from my last six years looking at the world of M&A. Uh, remember armor your mind there are lots of no's be persistent work on your positioning make sure you look like a safe pair of hands um keep having those questions the better your deal flow is the more businesses you'll analyze the more businesses you analyze the more conversations you'll have the more conversations you have the more offers you make the more offers you make the more deals will get done so yeah, absolute pleasure. Thank you so much. If you, as I say, if you're sitting on the fence, uh, definitely consider the VIP upgrade for next week. You're going to get access to all of the speakers. You won't just be listening. You'll be able to interact with them as well. So thank you very much, Michael. Um, thanks for helping us with the presentation. Stuck there at the beginning. And uh, have a great day, everyone. Great. Thanks, Ross. Yeah, and so for anyone still watching, um, you know, if you're, and if you're watching this on recording, you can hit pause. And so this is bit.ly bit slash uh, BAVS for Business Acquisition Virtual Summit, VIP. That'll take you to the VIP page for information uh, to learn more. Yeah, like Ross said, you know, um, you can submit your written questions to the experts during the Q&As. Um, you're going to get lifetime access to all of the uh, all of the recordings of the event, as well as join that online conference room. So uh, that's kind of similar to Zoom. It's, it's, it's actually... Uh, even better, it's, it's like a, a virtual tables that you can join, you know, uh, four to eight people, right, give or say, to be able to network uh, with people multiple at a time. Uh, one event that I went to uh, that had something similar, uh, the, the last speaker was at six at night, and we were there until one in the morning still talking. 
So it's really fun. It really feels like a, a live event. It's going to be an incredible event next week. And um, so hope to see you there. And Ross, thanks. Thanks for everything today. Awesome. Take care, guys.